I'll begin with uh, 1901. We heard a story about August yesterday uh, in the quiz by Dr. Navin Jai Kumar. So August was admitted in an asylum, in psychiatric asylum in Frankfurt. Um, and there she met her new neurologist slash pathologist slash psychiatrist who thought that August is not one of those run-of-the-mill patients. She's behaving a little differently from the other uh, disorders of psychiatry which was known at that time. And he actually became obsessed with August. So much so that when August was supposed to be transferred from Frankfurt Asylum, this uh, neurologist used his influence to make sure that she stayed back in Frankfurt Asylum so that he continued to follow her. In 1906, uh, she died. 1907 against 1906 itself, against all odds and with a lot of bureaucracy, the, uh, the neuropsychiatrist slash neurologist uh, could obtain the autopsy of uh, her brain. And as uh, he had suspected, he found a lot of neurodegenerative changes, the plaques and the deposits in the brain. And there was the beginning of a new disease, which was not known at that time which now we know as Alzheimer. The, the neuropsychiatrist uh, or neurologist was Alzheimer. And now, uh, the Alzheimer's disease is a multi-billion dollar industry. So what started as a concept, any art form starts with, it, with an imagination or a concept. So what started as a concept or uh, as an observation got augmented, as Dr. G.C. and others have been talking about, got augmented by science. It was reproducible. Whatever he thought of, whatever he imagined, got reproduced. He himself reproduced it. And then commerce lapped up the whole uh, scientific thought. And now we know that uh, Alzheimer's disease is a known disease. So this is an example of a concept which can get evolved from art to science to commerce. We'll take one more example. Uh, we have been talking about uh, visual fields throughout the day, and I was talking to Dr. Ramesh, and he was saying, uh, incidentally, when I was writing my first CS, Dr. Ramesh had come to Shankar Nitralaya for training, and he was saying that, you know, yeah, we're talking about all these visual fields, but we're not talking about confrontation, we're not talking about the red desaturation, which are still, uh, uh, which has its relevance, and I completely agree. Because, uh, a person who comes in, walks into our OPD, who complains of headache and a vague visual symptom, you may not be able to get the formal visual fields for all of them. But doing a confrontation for all of them, it's easy, and it's a good screening tool, which will allow you to weed out the people who may be having a neurological disease, and of course, it will safeguard you against a medical implication. But the problem is, uh, confrontation, visual field is an art, and it has lost its relevance by and large because of so much of advancement which has occurred in a, in a perimetry. So uh, we end up even now teaching the, the steps of confrontation and for the people who are going to take exam or even uh, uh, the confrontation steps can be three steps. If a patient comes in, if you have to do a confrontation visual field, you ask the patient, look at my nose or look at my ear. Question number one, while you, you are looking at my nose or looking at my ear, is any part of my face missing? So that's question number one. If he says, yeah, part of face is missing, you already have ruled out a central scotoma, centrocecal scotoma, uh, you have screened it. You can land up in a little funny situation, at, as it happened with me when I was teaching confrontation to a group of students, and I had just passed my FRCA, so I was full of enthusiasm. So I asked the patient, look at my nose. Can you see my nose? Yes. When you're looking at my nose, is any part of my face missing? The patient said, yes. What? Hair. <laughs> now, that's, that's not the point. And believe me, after that, I've stopped uh, demonstrating confrontation. I asked somebody else to say, demonstrate confrontation. So that's, that's, that's the first question that you ask. Is any part of my face missing? Of course, it's done monocularly when you're looking at my nose or looking at the eye. The second part of confrontation, again monocularly, is where you project hands in four quadrants and ask the patient to count fingers sequentially, here, 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 here. So if patient says he cannot count here, you know that patient has a superior ortinal defect, cannot count here, temporal defect, cannot count here, nasal defect. So it's a very easy um, test by which you can rule out 
a lot of these gross uh, visual field effects. So, and the third step uh, involves, again, patient closes the eye, and this is what is known as a kinetic confrontation, where you bring the uh, finger from the periphery into the center, and ask the patient to report when he or she can see the finger. So these are the three steps which can easily be done to screen your patients when patients have uh, some kind of neurological disease or you suspect that patient may be having a neurological disease, it's not very clear, it can be a good screening tool. But as you see, it, it's an art form and science had to augment it. The augmentation by and large started in uh, 1880 uh, where Von Graffe first uh, developed uh, what was then known as a campy meter. Then it took another century before Goldman came up with his kind of perimeter. Now, here again, how uh, science had to augment it. Because 1945 is where we got first fairly nicely scientifically backed perimeter. But neurosurgery had advanced much earlier. 19, 1907, 1906, already the neurosurgeons were doing transphenoidal pituitary adenoma removal. So now imagine you have a patient, the decision whether the skull has to be opened up, whether neurosurgeon has to intervene, or patient has something else, purely dependent on the art and the imagination of a perimetrist, either by confrontation or by Lister screening or by Jerem screen. So obviously art, is, art depends upon the expertise of the person who is performing it. Science had to augment it, make it democratic. So Goldman perimeter by and large did it. But even then, whether the person had a tumor or an ischemic event dependent, was dependent on an observation and a skill of a perimetrist, which was not reproducible. So in 1970, 70s is where I think the automated perimetry came into vogue. And slowly now we have got the automated perimetry, which basically has been designed for glaucomatous uh, disorders, but we have adopted it in neuroophthalmology as a gold standard. The, um, the problem is now, I'm sure 95, 98% of the people who are sitting here have not even seen Goldman perimeter, and almost I would say 99 or 99.5% of people don't know how to read if a, a perimetry chart is given. Uh, kinetic perimetry has its relevance, and I know that auto uh, automated uh, perimeters are now looking at even a kinetic perimetry to make it even more scientific. So this is a second example where art, uh, the concept was already present, that is visual field effect. Visual field effect, hemianopia was described by Hippocrates 2000 years ago. So you already had a concept. It was dependent on the expertise of a person who was performing that test, that is uh, uh, the examiner. The art got augmented by science over a period of time the art form became a standard of care and commerce made it universal because uh, industry saw money in this and of course uh, it, it has a utility for the society. The third concept on the same line, the evolution, worked of uh, VK8 syndrome was the first actually to, to demonstrate that there can be a wedge-shaped RNFL defect in people who may be having an ocular disorder. This was way back. In the 70s, uh, Hoyt of Bill Hoyt, Walsh and Hoyt fame, actually again published a paper and he demonstrated this wedge shaped defect in patients with glaucoma. So obviously picking up a wedge shaped defect as Dr. G.C. very nicely was demonstrating, dependent completely on a person's experience, his imagination and educational background. This concept, to make it more democratic, to make it uh, approachable to people who may not have either of these, uh, OCT was developed. Slowly, OCT also is becoming a fairly useful tool to augment uh, and diagnose some of these problems, especially in neuroophthalmology. There was a very nice paper uh, from Philadelphia. They did the OCT for patients who are undergoing, who are supposed to undergo pituitary adenoma removal. They did the OCT pre-op and then compared the results of recovery of the visual fields post-op. And they found, uh, Peter Savino and Helen danish that Anybody who had average RNFL, which was less than 70 micron, the chances of recovery of the visual field was much lower, versus somebody who had an average RNFL, which was more than 80. So this is a good utility of OCT to prognosticate 
what is likely to happen in somebody who is undergoing a neurosurgery. The second use of OCT has been uh, a definition of the disease. Parkinsonism, Alzheimer's disease, they don't have a direct connection with the visual uh, pathway, but they seem to reflect the loss of uh, average RNFL um, in the OCT. The third, uh, third such utility of the OCT has been in multiple sclerosis, where a patient who had a subclinical optic neuritis or no known clinical optic neuritis in the eye can still show a loss of average RNFL. OCT, OCT also helped to define um, the disease spectrum of multiple sclerosis because it was shown very early that even papillomacular bundle can get affected in multiple sclerosis. Now this is counterintuitive because multiple sclerosis is a disease of myelin and papillomacular bundle, uh, they are not myelinated. So how can early in the disease papillomacular bundle can show the effect and that's what uh, helped us to redefine some of the disease processes in multiple sclerosis. And the third important uh, utility of uh, the OCT has been to differentiate between a true disc edema and a pseudo disc edema. Uh, a true disc edema OCT will show a variation, while a pseudo disc edema drusen would OCT will show a consistently similar kind of average RNFL. So in short, again, something which started with an observation, science augmented it, and commerce made it universal. Though not all concepts go through this evolution, in uh, 18th century, a British observer uh, believed that optic neuritis is actually a disease where a lot of evil spirit gets accumulated in the head. And he thought about it, and then he came up with a solution. That if this evil spirit has to be taken out of the head, the person should repeatedly comb his hair. Obviously, he was a very insensitive fellow, never thought of a group of patients, if they develop optic neuritis, what will they do to take the, the evil spirit out? The science uh, never took up this, otherwise I'm sure by now the commerce would have lapped up this idea and we would have uh, organic comb to take out the evil spirit out of the head, become very popular. So one, uh, one step which uh, again was uh, emphasized repeatedly in these two days was that yes, art has to be augmented by science, art sometimes has to sacrifice its expertise to science to make it more democratic, but we should always dream of a thing where science should not sacrifice itself to commerce. Commerce should only support and augment the science so that you know whatever technology that we bring in is beneficial without being unethical. Thank you very much.